Welcome back to the APSCC webinar series. I'm Christopher Slaughter, your MC for the series. Today, our subject is mobility, communications on the move. Uh, joining us today for a, a look at the mobility sector is Robert Bell from SSPI. He'll be moderating today's session, which is brought to you by Hughes. And representing Hughes today, we have Reza Razulian uh, and Shivaji Chatterjee, both of whom are, are, are Hughes experts on the, the mobile sector. Uh, Shivaji, uh, actually from Hughes, India. Uh, also joining us today, uh, Bill Monroy from uh, ThinkCom and uh, Norman Chang from Longhua Enterprises. Uh, today, uh, a deep look at mobility communications on the move. Please enjoy. Hello, my name is Robert Bell. I'm executive director of Space and Satellite Professionals International. And we're here to discuss mobility communications on the move. Mobility is one of the hottest verticals in the satellite industry today. And this panel is going to explore the latest developments in mobility technology and applications. And with multiple LEO constellations soon to come online, this pa panel is also going to explore the respective roles of LEO and let's not forget MEO and GEO systems to address the mobility market. Uh, we're going to be speaking with some very smart and experienced people in this panel. Uh, and they are Reza Razulian, who is Vice President of Mobility and Broadband Satellite Services, Services at Hughes, also a member of SSPI's Board of Directors. Uh, Shivaji Chatterjee, uh, who is Senior Vice President for Enterprise and Government Business at Hughes India. Norman Chang, who is the Chief Marketing Officer at Longhua Electronics. And Bill Milroy, who is Chairman and CTO of FinCom Solutions. Now, gentlemen, I'm going to just give you a chance to uh, take a whack at our first question, which is really just get us, um, get us oriented here. What is the current state of communications on the move in the Asia Pacific? And we're talking about with you know, regard to the number of planes, vessels, vehicles that are currently in action there. Um, and just to, to, I guess we'll kick off. Why don't we kick off with you, Norman? Well, uh, the on the move uh, industry, uh, actually, in the airline is uh, doing very bad, badly uh, for the past couple of years. And uh, for example, like Cathay Pacific Airline, the revenue dropped eighty, almost eight, uh, eighty percent. So there's there's lot, not a lot of money uh, invested into uh, satellite communication in the aircraft at this moment. And that's why there's a lot to drop. Uh, but it, however, in the in the uh, maritime, the maritime is still uh, emerging and uh, doing pretty well. Uh, in for the however for the uh, uh, land mobile, uh, the land mobile industry also is moving, uh, especially uh, for for the Asia Pacific, uh, including China. China is, itself have been uh, doing a lot of uh, 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 mobile type of satellite communication, especially for the uh, 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 emergency services. And uh, they, they, they do a lot of vehicle uh, on the move or, or, or the, the police services. They're, they're, they're booming in China. So um, I think the, the industry is bad because of the COVID situation, but it's not as bad as some of the country, uh, some of the area in Asia. Got it, Norman, thank you. Um, Shiv, how about from where you're sitting in, in India? Yeah, so I'd like to kind of answer in two ways. Uh, I think Asia kind of, uh, is a developing uh, continent and we kind of on the mobility, we go with the trends and you know all the best practices and the developments and the failures and successes which have happened uh, in the you know in Europe and uh, the Americas. So in that sense, we are pretty much trying to adopt what has uh, already been proven and tested. So that's uh, you know that's the macro element and I have no doubt that uh, you know the adoption is growing across all sectors. I, I don't want to color it with the pandemic because the pandemic's impact on mobility is all around the world, you know, and that would then uh, you know the kind of statistics Norman said is true anywhere in the world. So uh, you keep the pandemic aside, and if you just look at the interest level, 
everyone is just itching to go to normal. And so, you know, I think all the preparation work, the interest, we definitely see that on the rise. And uh, clearly in India where the de-licensing uh, and the, you know, opening up for mobility services happened just uh, last year, it's uh, definitely, uh, you know, uh, a se sector which is on the move. We had no vessels in service and now we have about 50. And, uh, you know, it's the, and you're seeing uh, queries across the cross section. Definitely the most, I'll say, incumbent market is the offshore supply vessels and around the exploration sector. You now have fisheries coming in. Uh, so I'd say that there's a lot of action on the water because there are so many sub segments there. Uh, in the air, the business case is definitely the biggest challenge. But we see that, uh, you know, global providers are beginning to cover India as part of their service. And I think that's the start. And as every, uh, you know, innovation happens in India, we do expect a cost effective solution to emerge for Aero at some stage, which is going to blow the business case open. And, uh, you know, just wait uh, two or three years, it's bound to happen. Now, India is the world leader in coming up with things that are that are more cost effective than anybody else could have thought of. Um, just a quick a quick um, follow up. You mentioned some some liberalization of telecom regulation. I've been seeing some about that. Is there is there more coming? Yeah, definitely. You know, I think uh, the you know the VSAT license was very restrictive to only enterprises and closed groups with the maritime. Uh, and the Aero opening up for the VSAT license, they kind of allowed for the first time mobility. Just last week, uh, cellular backhauling, which was a specialized license, which didn't make the adoption, en masse got opened up for VSAT. In fact, it gels well with mobility because now you can also provide cellular and Wi-Fi backhauling even on the move. So I feel that, uh, you know, uh, this is the right way to go. And uh, a lot of the artificial barriers are giving way. And now it's just based on demand and business case and not uh, artificial restrictions. <laughs> it must be quite a relief. Um, now, satellite communications on the move, of course, has been around for kind of a while. Um, Inmarsat's been doing it in L band for just years and years and years and years. What's the driver now for this, you know, more up-to-date generation of KU and KA band services? And, and Bill Miller, I'm just going to check in with you because FinCom is pushing the envelope in a lot of ways. Sure. Uh, so uh, I think, of course, the, I'm not telling folks anything they don't already know, but between the services, there's, there's services that may be on the, I would call the high-end services being like the cellular backhaul and high-end meaning high availability, high data rate backhauling a lot of people. The, on the maritime side, the cruise ship lines, of course, will eventually come back, but those are big, big, big players, a lot of success at KA band with the O3B networks. Uh, but then on the other end of the spectrum, we are seeing a lot of growth in the M2M and the internet of things, the IOT markets, which generally have lower data rates, but still enjoy both uh, the, the benefits of having truly mobile solutions that would be, could be tracking uh, cargo and so on and so forth. So. L-band will be around, I, you know, L-band's not going away anywhere and, the, uh, and Inmarsat's done an excellent job that way. Obviously, L-band has some other physics uh, weather benefits to it in terms of uh, uh, just the, the physics of the situation. But KU and KA are definitely coming on. Now, I don't really want to get involved uh, in the what's better, KU or KA. I don't really see KA replacing KU. Uh, I think it just like KU didn't replace C-band, uh, things going around. So, uh, and, and there's, I think what it's really caused is everyone to up their game in terms of uh, going from wide beams to high throughput satellites to very high throughput satellites, more spot beams, more frequency reuse. And then speaking as an antenna supplier, this just puts more challenges on us to try to make systems that are, that are truly agnostic that can go across constellations. So KU, NKA. And then of course, the other big uh, item that's going on in the industry right now is the NGSO satellites. Now, O3B has already established a business case and is doing well there. Again, I don't, we hear, just like I was mentioning, is KA going to replace KU? We hear people, are NGSOs just going to displace all the GSOs? And I definitely think the answer there is no. 
Each one has its own benefits and it'll be great conversation for the rest of the group. From mobility on paper, NGSO has some advantages to the extent, if you're really talking about really on the move, not on the quick halt, then having uh, more reliable, higher elevation satellites to work with on paper is a really good idea. And I think in practice, it'll work out some, but particularly on mobile platforms, and we have a lot of experience on the aeronautical side, even, even, even if the satellites are typically going to be higher than 40 degree elevation, and actually that's what people use, but when you actually do the details, most of these satellites are going to be at 30 degree elevation. I'm talking about the NGSOs, and they'd really like to acquire them at 20 degree elevation because that gives you more time on the satellite. And then when you add in there the pitch and roll of an aircraft or a ship uh, or even a mobile platform of any type, you're kind of back to really needing to work at 10 or 15 degree minimum elevation angle. So we don't think NGSOs are, are going to replace Parks, but as an antenna supplier, we have to up our game and make sure that we're able to work uh, on NGSOs. And really, we think the vision is going to be a, a roaming capabilities, much like you do with your cell phone. Customers don't really care about satellites or terrestrial or KU or KA or NGSO. They just want to have ubiquitous coverage and not have to worry about it. And there's a lot of initiatives going on that way. And as an antenna part of that ecosystem, we just want to do our part to try to work seamlessly across all these different constellations and types. I don't know what it is about human beings. We always think that A is going to replace B or C is going to replace B. I mean, yeah, automobiles and, and, and buggies, all right, fine. But in communications, never, never happened. <laughs> or, K, or K is going to replace L. <laughs> right. yeah. The, 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 the frequency the, is the resource. You, you cannot replace anything, you know? Exactly. Exactly. The other thing I, I loved about this was, you know, the antenna man, manufacturers right now really put me in mind of Arthur C. Clarke's dictum that any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. I can't imagine how any of this is going to get done, but fortunately, I don't have to. Uh, Reza, of your point of view on this, on, on you know, what's being done with KU and KA in comms on the move that's new and exciting? Yeah, sure. Uh, so thanks for having us, uh, Robert, uh, and uh, thanks to APSCC for setting this up. Um, fundamentally, I, I chalk it up to being uh, the need for speed, right? So ultimately, uh, consumers, um, businesses, enterprises all need uh, a content-rich uh, access to, to broadband. And I think, uh, you know, to Bill's point, Inmarsat's done a great job at L-Band. It's resilient, it's highly capable, uh, but frankly, I think for, for folks that are looking for uh, a living room experience on an aircraft, you really need to move to KU or KA or KU and KA. Uh, and and that's, that's fundamentally um, the, the premise of, of uh, Hughes and, and our solutions uh, in, in and around making sure that we have the technology and the solutions to, to serve uh, that, that at-home experience whether it's on a plane, on a ship, uh, on, a, on, a, on any moving uh, platform, uh, if you will. Uh, when we think about NGSO and, and some of the new constellations coming to market, uh, it, it's pretty much the same, right? We're, we're eager and excited at um, uh, the advent of NGSOs, but uh, we, we believe there's a place for all of these solutions, just like L-Band is still here, GEO has its place. There are certain attributes of, of uh, geo uh, uh, throughput and, and uh, technology that will ultimately continue. Uh, and, and frankly, what, when you think about the, the LEO constellations, the low latency attributes are beneficial, but not in all applications. So, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, looking through the lens of a multi-transport, multi-orbit uh, enablement uh, to be able to not only provide the living room experience, but to provide the right bandwidth for the right application at the right time. Right. That's, that's the right application, right time with the right bandwidth. That's the golden, the golden promise. Um, let's talk for a minute about aeronautical. Um, they've been offering internet on planes for quite a while now. Most of the time it's been a pretty limited experience from the consumer's point of view. It's changing. And now the conversations are starting about free bandwidth. That's, of course, the way to make sure you get lots of consumption. Is that going to happen in the Asia Pacific region? Nolan, what do you think? Um, 
as far as I understand, the you know I I flew uh, Cathay Pacific one time and I purchased the uh, the in flight you know try to use it, and recently uh, 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 they actually offered it free to use uh, to try. Uh, I'm sure that in the in the future, uh, if, depending on what type of airline ticket you purchase, if you buy business class or you buy first class, you probably get it for free anyway. Uh, the Economy, they they may allow you to use it for minimum data, but you know that I think that would be the way to go. Uh, that's how you you cover it from in, in the in the when you book the ticket, you want to pre-purchase your 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 data pack or whatever. So this is something just like uh, some of the service airline, you, know, you buy your lunch or or you, you or meal or same thing. I think that eventually will be something that you want to purchase ahead of time with a discount. It's funny, isn't it? I mean, there is probably no industry in the world that's better at that that differential pricing of you know making sure we pack as many get as many dollars or or yen or euro as we possibly can <laughs> out of it, uh, and they're good at it. But I think there's a larger business model question in all of this, which is uh, you know the, the airlines say they want this, and it's fairly expensive for them to get it integrated into their aircraft. Although thanks to work from you know, companies like like Bills, it's getting cheaper. <laughs> But from the point of view of how do they make that business model work? Is it is it an absolute necessity for them to have this or, or is it not? I still can't get my arms around that. Anybody have an opinion? Well, I think, uh, I, I, uh, so if I could uh, chime in, I think that uh, uh, the move to the cloud, you know, so uh, uh, speaking selfishly as being in the industry, and I think probably speaking for all of us, moving things to the cloud is a good thing because uh, it requires then folks to have access to the cloud 24 seven, which then implies on an aircraft, you need to have that. Now, I think back and forth between the cloud, I, I'm old enough to remember several moves back and forth, you know, between the cloud and distributed computing and centralized computing. And I've seen it gone a f go a few cycles. So I'm not sure we'll always stay in the cloud. And now you're hearing terms of like edge computing, which is essentially meaning taking smartness out of the cloud. And you can see how eventually maybe the cloud will become less important, but for right now, Cloud connectivity is key, and that's good for our business. Now, the free service, of course, the nice thing is I must, I'm going to give a secret away. We don't give our antennas away for free, but we do our best. <laughs> you don't. We, we keep the price. Well, just today, only for other panelists. But uh, but on other days, we, but we, of course, CapEx is a big uh, part of the consideration in terms of the overall OpEx. So one of the things that free brings on, and maybe it's obvious, maybe it's not, is and the concern I think in the industry is free from a price point supply and demand is going to bring on a huge increase in the uh, in terms of sessions. So, so might have five or ten percent on you know pretending how much you're charging uh, use uh, or uh, adoptions on the on a given aircraft. And most of the times in these free models, and now we're starting to get data on that, that might go to sixty or seventy percent uh, move. Of course, all, the other trend in, in the consumer or the, uh, the consumer end is the over the top, the, the move to over the top, moving away from traditional broadcast type approaches to an over the top experience, which is just making streaming all the more important on the aircraft. So in the antenna part, really uh, free is great for the consumer, but they, they want free and they wanna have great quality of service and they wanna have a great quality of service while perhaps we're gonna see a a, a 10x increase in the number of use, users contending for the same frequencies, the same transponder sizes, and so on and so forth. So it means for all of us that we need to be extraordinarily efficient in the way we allocate bandwidth in terms of doing that dynamically rather than statically, that we bring up things like spectral efficiency, that for each, each megahertz of bandwidth, we're squeezing out of the grape, if you will, as many megabits or megabytes per megahertz that we possibly can. And there's going to be more and more pressure as we do that, even in and especially in this free industry. Robert, what I'd like to say is that more than free, I think it will go into bundled. You know, I think that's a better uh, way of putting it. It definitely will be part of the offering. Uh, there's no doubt that, uh, you know, you can't have blackout spots. Uh, you know, whether it's in a remote area or in uh, in the air or water. So it's uh, it's going to happen, there's no doubt. 
And but I see it getting bundled into the offering. One airline in India told me, you know, when we were discussing the business case, etc., is that uh, 20 percent of all their ticket sales are to corporate buyers. And those corporate buyers always buy the meal, buy the, you know, check in and, uh, you know, all the value added stuff and they bundle it. So they found it very easy to, you know, add Wi-Fi into that model. And if you can, they felt that if they can get that 20 percent, uh, you know, as a threshold per aircraft already buying these bundled packages and a corporate affordability is always more. You know, the ticket prices, uh, which a corporate or a business traveler buys compared to a, a home traveler is so different uh, because of the proximity to travel. So that's the whole uh, thing. I feel that, uh, you know, uh, the bundling is going to possibly be the way because the cost is just too much for it to be free. Well, again, the airline airline industry is are geniuses at getting most of their revenue out of the you know the front of the plane, if you will. So, yeah, that's, that isn't going to change. We tend to think of this comms on the move as requiring a global network, um, and certainly that's in many cases is true. But what what do you think is going to be the role of regional satellite operators? Asia Pacific has got a very large number of regional operators in providing these comms on the move uh, solutions. Is it going to be limited to just providing, you know, the connectivity, the, the, the bare bent pipe, or do you think there's other elements that either are already or will be added to that? Uh, Reza, do you have any, any perspective on that? Uh, sure. Um, it, it's actually a very good and interesting question. Uh, frankly, uh, there is a lot of regional density, uh, not only in aero, but also in maritime. So when you think about comms on the move and, and regional operators, I think there's huge, um, uh, possibility in extending their fabric and extending their investments into comms on the move. Uh, you know, le leveraging the Jupiter platform, a lot of our customers do that today. So Jupiter uh, is open AMIP compliant. We've integrated uh, with a multitude of aero antennas, obviously FinCom uh, being one of the key antenna systems, uh, but, but also from a maritime perspective, uh, you know, Orbit, Intellium, Cobham antennas. And our, our service provider partners and customers leverage their uh, solutions and fabric across multiple verticals. And, and frankly, there are some customers that do require a global reach, but when you look at regional fishing, for example, or regional airlines, the smaller, smaller jets, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity, uh, not only for national interests, but also uh, to, to further monetize uh, their investments. So, so again, I, I think it's, it's a very good opportunity uh, to start regional and maybe expand uh, glo you know, globally. Uh, for example, you know, we, uh, some of our larger uh, aero service provider partners are looking for you know, uh, additional KU and or KA capacity uh, that have the Jupiter waveform. Uh, and are interested in talking to folks. So these discussions are continuously happening. And as, as uh, our waveform is kind of proliferated in these regional networks, we, we do see adoption and demand and you know, further monetization, not only in the fixed area, but in mobility as well. That's an interesting angle that I hadn't heard before, which is that the extent to which a regional operator, and again, Asia's got a lot of them, can, integrate its services effectively with a global operator to get that, you know, to sort of solve that problem, if you will, for customers. Uh, is, that, is that fairly common? Is that, is that common in your world there for the Jupiter system? So absolutely. So one, one of the things that, you know, kind of conscious decisions we made was to invest in, in the mobility space in a, in a very sophisticated roaming feature that uh, enables uh, service providers and regional operators to build commercial relationships uh, to offer the managed megabit versus having to buy megahertz, having to invest in the CapEx and, and build out uh, infrastructure. So in this model, um, there's, a, there's a process VR network management system to link these fabrics together. So rather than um, forcing everyone to, to purchase megahertz and buy more and more equipment, 
uh, we've taken the, the um, approach of, of opening up our ecosystem in the sense that letting partners talk to partners uh, on a proactive basis and creating these, these relationships and synergies. And, uh, you know, it's working well. You can have an aircraft depart uh, the US leveraging the Jupiter managed capacity uh, over to Europe on one of our partner satellites uh, and, and traverse Europe into the Middle East and into Asia as well. So that, that's where the opportunity lies for, you know, uh, in active discussions uh, with a number of players. And, and again, with existing customers that want to expand their business. So uh, maybe they have a, a robust fixed network of, you know, a few thousand sites and they'd like to get into mobility. It's a very easy upgrade. In fact, the software is already there uh, in the Jupiter baseline. So we're, we're proud of that. Uh, I think it's a huge differentiator and it underscores our open model and open mentality in the sense of making sure that, you know, uh, to, to meet the airline's demand uh, and, you know, the move to a free or freemium and or uh, to, to meet the, the user experience that a, that a commercial shipping vessel would need, uh, you know, leveraging the Jupiter platform, we can enable all of that while trying to minimize the capex. I think that's, I think Bill mentioned this too, and Bill will we'll take all the free antennas he can give us. Uh, <laughs> uh, customers be happy, uh, but, but it's, it, it all comes down to cost. So if we can work together as an industry to, to minimize the cost burden, not only on operators, but, but ultimately the end user, that'll lend itself to better performance, living room experience, and, and, and frankly, Connectivity for all, you know, ubiquitous connectivity for all. I was interviewing, uh, recently interviewing the Peter B. D. Selding, the legendary uh, journalist in our in our area. And I asked him, you know, one of his asked him was, what are, what are going to be the most important things that happen in this industry? And he said, broadband, 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 broadband everywhere. There's no reason not to have it. Everybody should have it. Everybody should have as much of it as they want. I'm like, okay. Um, are there things, critical elements for success for let's say a regional operator that decides uh, that it wants to you know, implement a mobility strategy on a regional basis to start with? And this is really a question for anybody who's, who's seen this in action. Uh, what, you know, what needs to be done first and second? So oh, buying, uh, bu bu buying antennas from Norman or Bill, but after that, what what, <laughs> what, what we're doing now uh, for regional service actually, uh, uh, we we other than the global uh, satellite coverage that we uh, establish uh, using the Hughes uh, entire Hughes network uh, solution with mobility, and uh, we are now uh, working on developing the uh, China fishery market. Uh, there is. Uh, over 100,000 of, uh, of, of fishing vessel in China. And uh, they, uh, they uh, around, uh, around 2,400 of the group, they, they, they go uh, outside of China sea, sea water, but the rest, over 100,000 of them is uh, in, in the regional area. So we are targeting that market uh, very strongly now. Uh, there is some, uh, if you, if you Work with the right angle. There is uh, some subsidization for the uh, uh, fishery fishery industry, so so we are talking in that. And uh, outside of uh, Asia, we are working with the uh, Hughes Europe, and also with the uh, Hughes India. Uh, we are we have roaming partnership that our our, our, our vessel would go into uh, Indian water. Will be using the Hughes India services, and uh, we also are cooperating with the Hughes. Uh, in Europe and other than the global services, we are also uh, uh, combining the uh, uh, the regional service. We are we are now trying to work on the, uh, a backup service using the uh, Hughes S band, uh, which is the uh, Echo Star Mobile, uh, so that uh, we have a have a have a ability to switch between the 4G, the broadband satellite, and the narrowband satellite because. Uh, KU or KA satellite, you always may have some kind of blockage uh, that, or or you may not have the global coverage is somewhere that you 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 have no coverage. Then you need the backup services. So 
So uh, for Grobo, we work with the uh, uh, uranium. We're using the uh, companion services for mobility. And but for for Europe, we're looking to uh, for regional services, we're looking into use, using the Echo Star Mobile uh, S bands to to uh, for our for our backup. So so we are we are looking at the uh, regional service ser seriously. Very interesting. It's not at all the answer I expected to hear. Um, so the first step when th in becoming a regional player in mobility is to think entirely globally about all the th all the connections you need to have, whether they're with other satellite carriers, with S-band or L-band carriers, with cellular carriers. Yeah, it makes a tremendous amount of sense, but it's a very different it's a very different world maybe than just a few years ago. Um, Let's talk about vertical integration for a minute, minute because there's so much money sloshing around in, this, in the broader space industry right now. There's a heck of a lot of it going on. You've got uh, this rocket company that suddenly is a broadband company called Starlink, right? Putting up spacecraft every time they turn around, totally vertically integrated. Viasat, when they, after they put up their, their HTS satellites, they went for a totally vertically integrated play. Um, is this a necessary element for long-term success? Um, I, I like to think not personally, but but I'm curious in the views on the panel. Well, I, I'll take a shot at that. I I think the dynamic, as I mentioned in one of my previous answers, uh, as an antenna supplier, it's very important that we be agnostic or as agnostic as possible. So we're going through a lot of work to make sure that our antennas work on all the GSO satellites that are available today and tomorrow, particularly on Hughes but also be able to work with NGSO satellites. Although that, who's gonna be successful both from a technical and maybe more importantly a business standpoint is unclear. So we think folks are looking for a hybrid solution that will work on NGSOs. And by that, you know, that's LEOs, MEOs, and even HEOs. Uh, we think that's very important. So we're all in favor of uh, being agnostic. Now, uh, in terms of the vertical comp company, I think that makes a lot of sense for being vertical because you can control the entire experience. Um, but I can tell you, uh, and we're not, that's not the nature of our business, but we can tell you customers who deal with that, uh, generally the customers really like the agnostic capability. So talking about IFC may be somewhat obvious. Folks want to be able to put equipment on their plane, antennas and the other parts of the system that are going to be future-proof. That's perhaps a little, a little overused in terms of future-proof, but we'll be able to roam onto all the different systems that we've been talking about here, and uh, GSO and NGSO, and then amongst the different networks. Um, and so uh, uh, the, the customer is really driving that. And of course, they have, a, they have a good economic reason. It's that because then when the equipment's on there, they, they can negotiate perhaps year-to-year -year contracts rather than long-term contracts and be, have a little more negotiating Come, come from a little bit more of a negotiating point of strength for coming up with the future services. And further in the aeronautical, we have are the Eric 791 and 792. And that's really more about if you do have to change your equipment, the airlines would like to make that as easy as possible. We're not quite there to plug and play, but the purpose of the Eric 791, 792 is essentially to be a plug and play that you can remove uh, one set of uh, antenna equipment. We affectionately now call that rip and replace and put on a, another type of equipment to work to the next area. So there's a commonality and standardization and lugs and other mountings particulars to the aircraft uh, industry. So in summary, I think from a supplier standpoint, we think actually uh, being agnostic and broad, not vertical is, is important. We think the customers feel that way too. But that being said, those who have chosen to go vertical, we can see some of the uh, economic potential economic and business benefits for them if they can overcome the concerns that I mentioned from their customer base. I recently did a, uh, worked on a report on the cloud and sort of current state of the art. And one of the largest concerns that cloud customers have is lock-in. Right? I'm gonna get all my stuff on AWS or all my stuff in the Azure or Google cloud. And now I'm stuck. Definitely so sticky sticky's a good word if you're on the uh, supplier side, not so good if you're on the user side. Exactly, it's a magic word, isn't it? Are there other points of view on this? And you know, is, is this, are we going to see increasing verticalization ultimately of everything? You know, the famous, the famous uh, line about the U.S. Air Force that in some year in the future, it will, a bomber will, there won't, the bomber will be, you know, cost $11 billion, but there won't be one of them. So <laughs> other points of view? I, I would say it depends, uh, Robert. Uh, 
you know, in, in some cases there's there's some benefit uh, to vertical integration, but in other cases, you know, to Bill's point, customers do want flexibility. So, uh, you know, I think uh, those who can provide uh, flexible uh, architecture where, you know, you're not limited to just one platform or one uh, orbit, if you will, uh, specifically in our space, I think um, it, it'll provide more benefit to the customer. Now, uh, Hughes as a company is vertically integrated in some areas, uh, like our consumer business, we're, we're, we're vertically integrated and that works well for us because the consumer market is a bit different. But when you look at, uh, you know, the aero world, we made the conscious decision of, of partnering. And that's what's enabling us to, to, to grow our footprint via strategic partners and investments. And frankly, um, there, there is some cost benefit to being totally vertically integrated, but there's also some drawback from a customer point of view, right? So here, um, for example, if there's a, a customer that uh, wants to align with you know, national interests in a certain area, but also wants to roam onto other other constellations, you know, using our platform, we're, we're absolutely open uh, to, to that uh, kind of architecture. So, so I, I I would say it depends on the vertical. I think in the consumer broadband space, we've had success in North and South America, and through some of our partnerships in doing that. But we also have customers that have a consumer broadband business that are not vertically integrated. Uh, and are enabling tens and thousands of, of users and they're very successful. So I think, uh, you know, it really depends, depends on the solution, uh, but there is uh, uh, the ability to be successful uh, while not necessarily being vertically integrated. So I would say you don't have to be vertically integrated to be successful. Well, and of course there's certain engineering requirements that tend to promote verticalization in certain segments and certain parts of this, this value chain. Uh, and I think it's been pretty clear. Um, anybody else wanna, wanna weigh in on that? Because otherwise I'll ask a different question. Yeah, I, I think it, uh, you know, everyone would like to be vertically integrated provided you have the competence to be able to do that. And you have the economies of scale to be able to support that decision, right? If you look at, uh, the consumer business use is famously integrated and that was the first successful business case the minute we started getting there. Uh, we don't launch satellites or make them, but uh, we used to at one stage and, uh, you know, but we still own the satellite, which was kind of a first and that's what got the economics to make consumer satellite broadband even a reality. And today that's the biggest uh, driver for satellite capacity around the world. So if we hadn't done that, maybe that industry wouldn't have come about like it has. So, uh, uh, so I think that's the goal, provided the competence and business case. And obviously the economics are, are not there with most, uh, you know, like uh, in India, we wouldn't have it. Uh, so you wouldn't, so everyone then would need to blend and, you know, work together. I think what has to make sense is even if you're not integrated by companies working strategically together and not looking at their own fat EBITDA margins, but looking at the business case and the goal, that's when I think the ability to integrate and work across companies can still provide that same effect. And I think that maturity and for the satellite industry, we need to protect that end goal to make it a good proposition and a viable business case more than look at our individual short-term interest. And I think that maturity is coming as the niches are getting very clear. And uh, I think we'll see companies even working together uh, to get the same effect of a vertically integrated company. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I mean, vertical integration is great if it's your network and I think you give up a certain flexibility and you get a little closed and it's really tough to remain innovative over time. Um, I want to turn to a, another debate that's still going on, although I suspect we're going to get the answer for it fairly soon, uh, about the NGSOs, right? Because it, it's, it was, I think it was Bill who said, so, you know, the NGSOs are not going to replace every other satellite in the world, surprise, surprise, but there is a question of their relative merits in different applications. So, um, 
the discussion, as I understand it, revolves around, you know, what's the value of low latency and how, what's the price that can be charged by an NGSO, which has invested enormous sums of money in a global network versus delivering the same service from geo, let's say. And I'm just curious, you know, wh where you think that's going to fall in terms of what applications will run over NGSO, and, and many of them will be mobile, and which ones will not. Uh, Norman, do you have a, a, a do you want to weigh in on that? I don't mean to put you on the spot. I, I, you know, it may not be your thing. I'm not sure, really. <laughs> well, welcome to the club. Yeah. <laughs> Otherwise, it wouldn't be a debate. Who's got Who's got an opinion on this? Because I, I hear some time, some time, sometimes some very passionate opinions on the topic. Well, I, you know, I think uh, as I well, you already know, I'm kind of on the record as saying I don't think uh, NGSO is going to replace GSO. It may just create an extra faster. And, then, and you've asked us uh, uh, to kind of concentrate maybe more on the calm and the move part of that, which is. It's a question of what kind of applications are going to try to do come the move. I, you know, I point out people talk about oh, the latency is so important, so important, and, and some applications can benefit from lower latency. Some don't really, you wouldn't really notice a big uh, quality. Like streaming is generally not not very latency specific. We're going to and streaming is a big part of in our particular industry what you do. So I'm not sure that's going to change the user experience. It's true that if you're into high end electronic gaming. Uh, that uh, every millisecond counts, but you know, even I think it's, I, I'm not a gamer, but I, I know people who are, I mean, even, even on terrestrial networks, local terrestrial network, my understanding is they run these competitions locally, not, not for any organizational reason, but because if you're not competing, if you're competing outside a very small local area, Southern California here in the United States, you'll lose to, if you're uh, relative to where you are relative to the server. So we're talking about shaving milliseconds. And there are other markets, other applications that could shave milliseconds, electronic trading, kind of, there's a lot, you know, people have almost, some, some Leo systems have tried to cater just to electronic traders. So I'm not saying there's not use there. I think though, if we're looking at the 80% kind of marketplace, I think GSOs do fine. I mean, we're still seeing more and more new adoptions for, for instance, uh, cellular backhaul, 5G backhaul versus GSO you know, so people say, oh, can you do VoIP? Can you do that? Can you do that? Uh, yes. So uh, our thinking is that the, the NGSOs are, you know, bring other parts to it. Now, I did mention the higher elevation angle, which can be important, but that's obviously very dependent on the size of the constellation, the altitude of the constellation, uh, whether you're on a moving platform. So we think until which time, which I'm not sure that's ever going to happen, but obviously there's people talking about putting as many as 42,000 LEO satellites up, which if you just do the math on that, you probably are gonna have a pretty large cloud of satellites that you could choose from, uh, you know, from maybe as many as eight or 10 satellites visible at any one spot. Uh, we can see how that's gonna help on the calm on the move market. Now on the calm on the move, truly calm on the move though, you do have these other things like bridges, street signs, things like that. You're gonna have blockages, unplanned, unanticipated blockages. This happens in maritime as well, of course, in terms of bridge blockage. And there are ways to overcome this by using multiple antennas. Like for instance, most of the cellular backhaul systems that we're looking at for NGSO services actually want to have two antennas. They don't want one antenna with dual beams. They want two single beam antennas. Why? Because they want to separate these by 10 or 15 meters so that they're never shadowed by the cell tower that comes by. Now that shadowing wouldn't occur very often, but if you're trying to offer 59, 99.99% availability in a cellular backhaul service, which is not uncommon, that's what you have to do. So I think when looking at NGSOs and, and looking at the latency issue, the higher elevation angles specific to calm on the move, you have to make sure you dot the I's and cross the T's on that relative to the actual user experience, the actual quality of service of the applications. And when we think you do that, it's not going to be a revolutionary change. It's going to be an evolutionary change, but that's just my personal opinion. No, that's what opinions are what make a good panel. <laughs> Rosa, how about you? What's your personal opinion on, on, on this issue of you know, the application sensitivity? I mean, it, basically we're talking about niches. I mean, satellite's the business of niches. And the question is what, you know, what, are, what are going to be the niches that the NGSOs will succeed in? Yeah, I, I do think, I mean, mobility is a, a, a really good um, uh, 
uh, use case uh, for satellite in general, right? I think we've, we've clearly established that. So what the NGSOs would ultimately bring is a low latency, which is uh, beneficial, but not, not, not for all applications. So, um, you know, th there's probably space for, for a number of these constellations to be, you know, successful uh, as they work hard to, to, you know, obtain their funding and close their business cases. Um, I, I think going back to the, the hybrid model, uh, um, and let, let's say, uh, I, I don't believe there's like a, a one size fits all. There's certain applications that could probably benefit from more NGSO than GEO, right? There's other applications that are, are the reverse. So for example, an aircraft full of folks that want to stream video, right? So as, as we move into the OTT world, uh, that aircraft, you know, the, the question becomes, What's the what's the what's technically the, the most uh, relevant and the most efficient way of delivering that bit to, to that end that device, right? And then you, you know you kind of think about the investments made and and uh, you know what what's the best asset to serve that need. So if you think about densely populated areas that do have geo coverage that have geo high cap high throughput capacity. Uh, frankly, the latency doesn't matter uh, for an OTT video, right? You buffer the video a little bit and, and uh, you get the living room experience. But then if you have an application that requires some more interactivity, it, it does matter, right? So that then you, you think about, okay, well, how do I, uh, in a smart way, leverage both resources and make the best use of each resource? So that's kind of the lens that, that I'm looking at the, the problem uh, through, uh, there's really the right resource for the for the right application at the right time. And again, there's a lot to unpack there, including uh, technology, right? And, and I think the ecosystem is working hard to, to solve those because, you know, when you think about the, the customers that, that are going to consume uh, this, this, this throughput, uh, each customer is a little different. In Aero, it's it's a bit more difficult because antenna technology is still evolving. Uh, I, I think you know partners have done a good job evolving, but there's really today no solution that can can do geo and leo at the same time, right? It's either or. I think as 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 we move to the right, and I'd love Bill's opinion on this. Uh, that's kind of the, the holy grail, right? <laughs> uh, if you can do both at the same time. But on the other hand, when you think about the cruise market. Right, uh, you do have that today. There, there are you know multi-orbit, multi-band uh, antenna technology, um, uh, you know antenna systems that switch between C-band, KU-band, and KA-band. Uh, that that you know I, I happen to be involved in in the development of uh, in a previous life, uh, which which basically set up the cruise industry to ingest multiple sources of bandwidth, whether it's Leo, Mio, or Geo. So I think that that's kind of I, I I don't know if if the Leo ecosystem will be the one one size fits all. I, I do think there's a kind of a, a path where we use the best capacity uh, for the right application. So you know, and Geo for for many of the use cases does work well and will work well. So may the well, best satellite yeah. win. Yeah. Well, what? I look at it this way because I, I've been listening to uh, so many uh, different comments about uh, Leo, or Geo. Or, um, I would look at the point of view from Asia. Um, the landing right for surfaces is very difficult in Asia. Well, India, you already have uh, uh, one web. If Starling wants to get to India, I think that would be and not a difficult thing. And then you talk about uh, uh, Telestar and try to get you know, China, also another place that a uh, huge, mar huge market, but you know, can you get into it? And uh, different, different company have the different idea like Viaset, they believe that, hey, I don't need Leo. I need three, three satellite, XTS, give it one terabyte capacity. I can handle the global the same way. So, it's really, really is is the is the uh, 
cost of the equipment, the application will 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 provide, and then it's a, what kind of speed is necessary for different type of applications. Just like uh, sales state, a hey, application is really dependent. So I I wouldn't know. I, I'm not a. Uh, I could not foresee for when the Leo will be successful, but it could be very successful because because uh, if you're talking about on the move uh, antenna, uh, eventually if you have a mass production of the flat plate antenna technology for the move, maybe very inexpensive for for Leo because Leo is always tracking the satellite anyway, so. On the move, Leo could be very competitive in the future, and the cost of the data usage is much lower than than uh, uh, than the uh, geo satellite surfaces. So, so right now, you know, I, that's why I did not comment at the beginning because I it's, it's really a difficult thing to say at this moment. It is impossible to say, which is what makes it an interesting topic. Uh, Norman, if so I ask you a question, me also add my two bits. Okay. I just feel that the Leo systems are on paper and it's wrong to compare something which is still not deployed and on paper, you know. Uh, it's 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 like talking about a new movie which is going to be the big thing and you see the trailer, but uh, until you see the movie, you don't know how it is. So firstly, you need to let, you know, it has to roll out, it has to have the full constellation, you need to see how the service is and then do the comparison of how latency makes a difference because then you know the other characteristics in its uh, practical form. The other thing we must remember is mobility customers always take the most premium services. You know, they are the guys who pay the highest ARPU. They, they don't take shortcuts. You know, they themselves service and charge premium rates from their customers, whether it's on a cruise liner or on a plane. So it's all the more reason that, you know, the expectation level then can't be, oh, this happened and we lost service or that happened and there was an outage, you know? So it's it's not going to be that easy. I feel the Leo systems will go through uh, like a generational evolution before they can even come onto the plane where you're able to compare it with geo systems which may be in the third or fourth generation or maybe fifth or sixth and leo uh, you know which is still in its first generation so i think we must uh, it's like you should learn to walk before you run so i think we uh, we need to go through a practical uh, you know deployment and then do a comparison maybe same time next year okay well <laughs> okay to date to date I remember when SpaceX was new and that everybody was very excited about them and they were launching rockets and everybody was very excited about them. And I just kept saying to people, you know, until they blow up a rocket with a $200 million payload on the top, we don't really know. And they did. And they came through it with flying colors and look where they are now. You know, I just wanted to add one, uh, if I could, just one thing. So we, we talked about, you know, as engineers, we tend to look at all the technical issues and solving the technical problems. And, and as engineers, we also, we're not completely oblivious to the business problems, you know, What's the break even? How deep, you know, what, what, how, how red do we go before we get black? And what year do we turn the corner? But, you know, the uh, touched upon here is there's this third, which is perhaps the most nonlinear, which is these regulatory slash national slash sovereign issues. And with respect to NGSOs, and, and again, we're, as I said, we're very bullish on NGSOs. Uh, the problem, one of the challenges there is if you have a very low altitude NGSO at 500 kilometers, you need to have gateways, particularly one if you have one that doesn't have crosslinks. I'm not sure crosslinks solve all the problem. You need gateways that are, you know, every every thousand kilometers, probably denser than that. So when you run that up, we're talking about many thousands of gateways all over the country, and you're going to have to get permission in each individual country to put the gateway in there. And if that country happens to be a China or a Europe or a UK or an India, you're going to have you're going to run against some nonlinear this third challenge. Which is getting the so getting landing rights in the area now with a GSO it's a little bit easier. China of course has some specific requirements for working on in when, when in China, but in general you just need one nice gateway, maybe a backup gateway. Uh, so as, as few as three to four gateways, you can run a whole worldwide service. 
That's not the case in NGSOs. And of course, a lot of this has created a whole third ground infrastructure as a service market for, for servicing the broadband market. But that's another important consideration when looking at NGSO merits versus GSO. Well, this is certainly this is turning into the NGSO panel here. Um, I want, we're, we're getting a little bit low on time. I want to ask Norman a question because uh, I asked him, I, I did him the disservice of asking the question. He didn't feel it was in his wheelhouse, but he rallied. But uh, Nor Norman, your company provides a different uh, service called the LH Sat service. What what is? Well, LH Sat is a brand name. Yeah, okay. it's a brand uh, service brand for Longhua Electronic. Right. Uh, so we actually uh, deploy a global uh, satellite uh, maritime satellite services uh, mm -hmm. using multiple uh, satellite carrier, including Utosat. We partner with Hughes. Uh, we uh, we use JCSAT, we use TeleSAT to cover the world, and uh, I would say uh, 80, 80 to ninety percent of uh, our global coverage uh, for maritime, and uh, uh, we other than satellite coverage, we believe in applications. So other than the normal uh, voice over IP, uh, uh, behavior management, firewall, you know, uh, cyber tech, you know, the uh, we, we, we also believe one thing is called video surveillance. Uh, we start our business from Taiwan uh, because Taiwan is the largest uh, 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 maritime uh, fishery industry for cross, cross ocean uh, fishery. And uh, every one of those, uh, uh, cust our customer wanted to monitor their ship with real time video. And uh, we, we actually invested and founded a company in UK to develop video surveillance, cloud-based technology, especially for satellite. Because we, uh, we compress the video from six kilobit, as low as six kilobit. Hmm. Wow. So, <laughs> so our, our service is uh, running, uh, some of some of our customers running at 20 kilobit per second uh, streaming. We could put four video in one stream. So, or or 80 kilobit, you know, you have very good quality already. So the customer is very impressive with that. And in fact, that we are working on a project with uh, Hughes India for, for, for fixed location uh, for, for remote monitoring via satellite. Uh, and we, we believe that if you really want to stream video with high definition, it's going to cost you a lot of money. The data usage is going to be horrendous. So we, we found that we have a great solution for this uh, on the move, video, real-time video surveillance. And uh, as far as I understand in Europe, there's a requirement for certain uh, uh, vessel, they must in, install video surveillance. So we, we feel that there is a uh, other than satellite services, application is very important to attract your customer to come to work with you. And we're working with our partners uh, to develop that industry. Yeah, and I think you're absolutely, you're absolutely right. It's interesting because I've, I've been hearing about this for about a decade, but I've never really heard about takeoff from it. Now you, you know, it, it down between 20 and 6K, you've got the, you've got the factor to make that happen. We are again, we're coming up to the end of our time together. So I just want to finish by asking each of you to briefly talk about, you know, another thing that we can't prove, which is the future. Um, over the next five years was as this pandemic finally releases us. Uh, what do you expect is going to be, what do you expect to see in the Asia Pacific region? And uh, let's, Norm, let's stop, start with you. Um. I, I do believe the uh, uh, maritime uh, will will grow, and uh, we 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 definitely have to see what happened in the uh, in the this couple of year later on when the when the Leo come in and how how the uh, market may changes, but in this moment uh, the Leo maritime is going to be the one to to start with, and I'm not sure the the cost of the uh, uh, product of the Leo product is is it really going to be so competitive? That's, that's, that's my, my my yeah my view. 
Shiv, how about you? What's what do you what do you see happening in the next five years of note in the Asia Pacific region or even just in India? Yeah, I definitely feel there'll be a lot more deployments. Yeah, I still feel the whole market is at a very early stage. So there's only one way it can go. Uh, 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 <laughs> but I, I definitely feel, uh, you know, both from the lower end applications like fishing, fisheries and that kind of control to merchant shipping, the whole offshore uh, leisure and cruise. I think you're going to see a proliferation of all of that. Uh, there's no doubt. Uh, I, I agree with Peter that it's only broadband and connectivity and bandwidth, which is uh, going to drive things. So it's just a natural evolution based on each country, how innovative uh, each service provider is. I think we're going to see, uh, you know, different countries have different kind of uh, uh, proliferation as Hughes, uh, you know, we have a great mix of uh, service providers that we service around the Asia region. In India, we offer our own service, but everywhere else, uh, I see these service providers augmenting their uh, networks, Jupiter networks with mobility capabilities, working together to provide roaming, uh, you know, and uh, I feel that's going to create a mini ecosystem uh, within the Asia Pacific region for use. And, uh, you know, uh, Jupiter is such a great satellite system but it you know didn't have mobility till recently and i feel all the power which jupiter provides when you bring in mobility and the collaboration between all our regional service providers you're going to see a multiplier effect in terms of what that's going to bring to asia that's going to be sounds exciting Bill Milroy, what's uh, what's your view in the next ten years well, in that region? I know we're running short of time, so I'll try to I'll try to pick uh, one particular area. I, I think on the regulatory and the interference suppression part, and I know that SSPI, MUSA, GVF are all looking into this right now. You know, it used to be hypothetical with well, GSO satellites have been around for a while, and we always have had to share frequency bands, whether they be KU or KA between the various GSO, but this just meant adjacent satellite interference. So looking at satellites that are two degrees or four degrees apart, but now, and, and we always alluded to, the, the specs always alluded to the possibility that NGSO satellites would come online, but now here they are. And so now satellite, not only do we have to worry about interference in very small localized adjacent satellite slots, we have to worry about doing this everywhere. Essentially LEO satellites that we could be interfering with, or while operating on the LEOs, we could be interfering with the GSO planes. There's Article 22 requirements. There's a new WARC 19 ESIM requirements, but all these regulatory requirements are coming forward. And not, again, every country will probably address these differently, but, and to make things worse, I'll use KA band as an example. It's true at KU as well. The whole 27.5 to 30 gigahertz band is which, which is what the primary bands we use for satellite are also being used for terrestrial 5G services. So when we're on an aircraft or if you're on a ship, you need to take great care to make sure that when you're talking to the satellite in that band, that you're not interfering with terrestrial users using the same part. And some countries have chosen to be very strict on this in terms of limiting reuse in that band. So I think in the next five years, uh, it, it's still kind of the wild west out there regulatory wise, but I think we're probably gonna have some painful cases where interference is gonna come into play, satellite quality is gonna to begin to drop. Maybe companies are gonna start suing other companies, You know, get into that ugly kind of part. But eventually we're gonna probably have to adopt a lot of regulations from an antenna standpoint. That means having lower side lobes, better tracking on a mobile platform. We're gonna have a relook, I think again, on how accurately do you stay on the satellites while you're on a maritime aeronautical ground mobile platform. It's gonna be a revisit of all, all the regulatory items that we used to take for granted. It's uh, actually it's sounds, really, it's sounds like a party to me. Well, actually, uh, right now, uh, when we install uh, uh, equipment in the vessel right now, uh, if you have uh, EMAS set and at the same time you have uranium and you have KU band, it's already cross interference. So, so depending on how you uh, uh, install your antenna, how high and how low, and 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 the how, how, how much distance? They already tell you that, hey, you gotta be so much, uh, so far away from each other. 
And with the radar, you have the word of our radar frequency. <laughs> this is really a mess. Uh, you have to do a very uh, a good study in the, in, the, in the vessel before you do your installation. Wow. <laughs> Reza, last word to you on the, on the future. Unfortunately, you don't have much time. So let's see what sure. you can share with us. Uh, sure, thank you. So yeah, I, I tend to think that we're, uh, you know, COVID notwithstanding, I think we're all uh, hopeful that uh, we get past the pandemic. Um, uh, the future is bright, I, especially in Asia Pacific, not only in, in maritime, but also in aero. Uh, I, I would lean towards uh, uh, growth um, in maritime being more pronounced uh, and, and aero would come behind that, uh, depending on the constellations that are ultimately uh, launched or the geo assets that are launched. Um, uh, I, I think there's great, great uh, progress um, uh, in maritime uh, available, you know, as we speak. So, you know, we're, we're seeing it with partners like Lungwa and, and other, other customers in the region, uh, leveraging uh, Hughes technology and the Jupiter platform to, to really uh, further monetize their their assets and, and have a multiple multiple vertical approach. So uh, they're effectively monetizing their bits. So yeah, I, I think I think it's it's uh, it's a it's a great time uh, in Asia Pacific, and um, you know we're going to be able to uh, enable a lot of seafarers uh, to get in touch with their loved ones and um, you know communicate uh, back home. Uh, uh, you know, access the, the content they want to access, uh, things that they, you know, they can't do today. So I think we're, we're in a really good spot to, to help. Well, thank you very much. I want my thanks to Reza Razulian, to uh, Shivaji Chatterjee, to Norman Chang, and to Bill Milroy for a very interesting hour. Uh, we're, I think we're looking at a time in the future with a great deal of potential and a huge number of challenges. And that really makes it pretty much like most of the times I've lived through. Thanks so much for that, Robert. Thanks, Reza. Thanks, Shiv. Thank you very much, uh, Norman. And thanks, Bill. Uh, excellent panel. Really good, uh, really good look at, at you know, what's going on in, in mobility. Uh, please do join us. The, the series continues uh, here throughout the, the remainder of the year at, uh, at APSCCSAT.com. If you want to find out about more, uh, more of the, the upcoming events, please check the schedule. We're updating that all the time. Uh, it is on the, you know, we're changing the schedule and adapting things as we go. If you're interested in participating or presenting or being involved in sponsorship for one of the webinar series, please do get in contact with us and you can, you can reach us on info at apscc.or.kr. Uh, likewise, if you want to find out more about uh, APSCC, join us at apscc.or.kr, uh, you know, the, the relatively simple website. Um, have a look and, and see what's going on there. There are links uh, all over the place and you can find out more about what we're up to, what we're doing, and most importantly, how to join. Uh, please do let your friends know, let your colleagues know, uh, anyone who's interested. The registration for the webinar series is free, but you do have to register. So um, send them along and, and please do join us for upcoming episodes. Uh, likewise, if you're interested in the stuff that's gone on in the past, it's all available online with your registration. So thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you here again at the APSCC webinar series. <laughs>